Um, we'll start. Um, usually I wait a little longer, but we're starting out with six students or yeah, six students who didn't get a chance to present on uh, last time. It was either rape, sexual violence, or pornography. So we'll start with them. And then if more people come, um, that would be great. I have not filled out the attendance charts yet. Official attendance charts, obviously I'm taking attendance. But what I'd like you to do, I do have one post that says explain why you didn't come. And so before I go and do that, which I will do tonight or tomorrow, uh, if there were reasons why you didn't come to certain classes, write it in that post. And then I'll I'll check that post before I go and do the attendance chart. Christy, Christy. Yeah, good morning. Okay. All right. So I hope you I hope you got that. Um, please, if you miss some classes for a good reason, go post it. And I will check that and then I'll go take uh, official attendance. Um, I tend to, I give you the benefit of the doubt. I know a lot of you have a lot of obstacles, so I'm not very tough on that, but there has to be some limit. You know, I can't do nothing because that, that gets taken advantage of, but in general, I, I trust you. I don't have any problem. Oh, uh, Kala, I'm glad to see you. I know you had some, some issues you wrote me about, so that was fine. Were you here last time, Kala? Were you at the last class? I guess she doesn't hear me. Okay, so I will, we will start with the, the six left over from last time. And then we will talk about uh, female genital mutilation. I looked up to see data about Bangladesh or I, I just looked up, maybe I looked, you know, I didn't pick the right thing, but I just Googled female genital mutil mutilation um, statistics in Southeast Asia and the, somehow the chart didn't come up, nothing came up, but I have a, a YouTube, there's just a little four or five minute video. Um, and maybe some of you know information and you found something to present. And then we'll have the other article where there's just this whole tradition of women mutilating their bodies to please men. And so that was just an outline, but it was a long outline. And so in both cases in the reading for today, it's superimposed with Westerners' reactions, right? So female genital mutilation. Well, is it supposed to be moral relativism? You can't interfere or um, not. And I do think that this class about women's solidarity would emphasize, you know, that we support uh, women in not having to do that, just in general, right? In general, we support. So we're not gonna get caught up in anybody saying, oh, that's because they're Muslims or oh, that's because they're ignorant or something. I mean, no stereotypes, no demonizing, just empathy, for girls who go through it. You know, we're not gonna get political about it. We're just gonna have this sense that that's Persephone, that's the kind of victimization. Women get victimized in so many ways and we're not gonna argue about it. We're gonna just be women uh, thinking about how women are victimized because they're women, right? That's it and we don't have to divide among ourselves. Um, 
All right, so the issues from last time, starting with Dolana, okay? Yes, Professor, I'm okay. So do you wanna talk about pornography, rape or sexual aggression? Yes, Professor, I'm talking about the pornography. Okay. In Bangladesh, when I I have searched in <clears throat> um, Google, I found some law uh, like uh, like pornography is uh, totally uh, like uh, prohibited in Bangladesh. It is against the law uh, and to was produce, distribute, and process um, like. According to the um, Pornography Control Act 2012, uh, uh, <clears throat> in Section 8, uh, pornography has strictly restricted with uh, uh, like uh, massive uh, <clears throat> range of penalty, uh, like uh, <clears throat> under uh, under Section 8, one uh, like uh, uh, any act. Uh, uh, like uh, like capturing video uh, of uh, <clears throat> like uh, stealing pictures of uh, uh, like uh, sexual uh, intercourse uh, uh, of like exposing uh, uh, that type of behaviors it is like <clears throat> Uh, like um, it is uh, punishable with uh, Im imprisonment and also uh, eight luck. Uh, okay, um, uh, Delana, just a couple minutes. You know, we can't yeah. try to summarize what you have to say. Yes, I am saying about the law, uh, like uh, pornography law in Bangladesh. Is it fine? Yes. Go ahead. And also in section six, uh, like um, like uh, who try to um, like um, uh, making porn video uh, uh, with minor uh, like uh, offense. Uh, it's like uh, maximum ten years jail with uh, five lakh stack of fine. So uh, like uh, that's all okay. For, okay. according to the law of um, uh, pornography uh, control uh, act 2012 okay. in Bangladesh. Good. Okay, then there's the question of whether it's ever enforced, um, right? You might have it on the books, but it never gets. Nobody ever really goes to jail for it. <laughs> okay. Right? There's that problem, right? It's called when something is um, de jure, means according to the law, but it's not de facto, not as a matter of fact, right? So according to the law, you can't have child marriage, but as a matter of fact, it happens all the time, right? So um, that's true with female genital mutilation. In some countries, it's against the law, but people do it all the time. Yes, Professor, as um, we have law, but uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, ignored by us right. because of lack of uh, awareness among us. So uh, to like uh, prevent these uh, things, we have to increase our awareness among the people yeah it's that happens quite a bit and so yeah not only do women get victimized by the event then if they try to take it to the courts they get victimized again right and then they get victimized by other women who criticize them for trying to get their legal rights so it's layers yeah. and layers and layers of powerlessness um Hopefully in your lifetime, some of this will get better, but I mean, you can't aim too high. <laughs> if it just gets better, that's probably 
progress. Um, Rafa, did you have anything today? Okay. Um, how about Marzia? Oh, Rafa, do you have something? On pornography? Okay. Um, what about uh, Marzia? Yes, Professor. Uh, am I audible? Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, professor, I want to say that in Afghanistan, uh, pornography, according to law, is illegal and it's totally banned. Uh, but I mostly want to focus about women's uh, sexual abuses and women's victimization in Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you know that uh, at, uh, Afghanistan, a uh, woman uh, cannot talk because if a woman is raped, she cannot talk. Uh, it has many reasons that why she doesn't talk. First, uh, uh, it will, uh, according to the society, it will affect her herself and her family's honor. Second, if if anyone knows that she was raped, it will affect her marriage. No one will agree to marry her. Uh, and also another reason is that in Afghanistan, women are really uh, under uh, women are uh, really uh, under a bad treat. Uh, if anyone in the society knows that she was raped or she had uh, or she had a sexual relationship, maybe she will be killed uh, because uh, 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 because people say that it's against religion, uh, it's against uh, their honor. Even uh, other people out of their family allow themselves to think how to kill this kind of women. Uh, I'm sure, uh, Professor, that you have heard about Farhonda, about Rukhshana in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, it's uh, like, this is why that women cannot talk loudly, that they cannot raise their voice. Uh, a few years back, uh, I, I was small, but I have heard that what happened to Farhonda, uh, she was uh, uh, accused that uh, by a religious man, that she born the Holy Quran. In fact, it was lie, it was wrong, and she didn't, and after investigation, it was proof that she didn't do such things. But because he was a religious man and he said that she did it, everyone killed her so brutally. That's, that wow. even it, it's for me really difficult to talk that how she was killed. They killed her so brutally, and after that, they burned her body. And yeah. Yeah, and, uh, it's because that they have uh, they have allowed themselves to decide about others that how to define their religion, how to define their beliefs, and also Rukhshana. Rukhshana is another girl uh, in Afghanistan, in a rural part of Afghanistan, that she, her father and mother sold her to a very old man, but because she left another boy and they were they were happy together, then when the when the village men uh, and also her family figured it out they decided to stun her they stunned her and they killed her it is like they call it honor killing yeah it happens in afghanistan a lot uh, you know that in afghanistan like a rape uh, if a woman is raped they cannot raise their voice according to the law like it says that it has legal it should be legally processed but uh really a few uh, cases are uh, like uh, talked about uh, and also uh, like uh, uh, there is yes professor i you just have one minute i mean it's all good it's just that we have yeah everybody has to have a chance but go ahead okay. In one minute, okay. Uh, in 2012, Afghanistan recorded 240 cases of honor killing and 160 cases of rape. But in fact, it says that it's much more than these things. And right. also uh, uh, an example of an honor killing in 2013 in Ghazni province of Afghanistan, a man wanted to attack a woman uh, uh, and, uh, and attempt to rape her, but uh, he couldn't. And as a result, when the relatives of the woman uh, figured it out they killed uh, the the man and the women both uh, and uh, in afghanistan it's called honor killing uh, that yeah. is the most yeah the victim is mostly girls if they figure out they will kill the girl and also like they will beat 
the the boy or the, the man. Right. Okay. So actually, next time I'll probably assign an article on honor killing. Um, I didn't used to do that because I didn't want my students in the U.S. to to stereotype, you know. But if I have students and a specific one from Afghanistan says that yes, that happens in my country, um, then it's not a stereotype. It you know, it doesn't happen everywhere, but it really does happen. It still happens. So then I'll probably use an example. Or if you have an article, Marzia, you want to send me. Um, how about Mahira? Are you there? Do you yes. have to do okay? One minute. Yes. I have a data, a quantitative data for, uh, about sexual violence against women in Bangladesh. So from Odhikar Organization 2020, from January 2001 to December 2019, 6,900 women were victim of domestic and sexual violence. About 1,490 women were brutally gang raped. 483 women were killed after being raped and 35 committed suicide after being raped. Uh, raped. Another report from Aino Salish Kendro, this is an, uh, like, um, also an organization. Uh, during COVID-19 situation from January to September 2020, 397 women were died because of domestic and sexual violence, which is a common thing in Bangladesh. Women shut their mouths uh, about this. My husband beats me, no talking. And only 208 cases were filed. At least 90, 975 women were raped, 204 women were made victims of rape attempt and, and death after rape, 43 women. 12 women were committed suicide after rape and, and among them, 762 women were raped by single accused, while 200 suffered from gang. This is the okay. statistic of Bangladesh uh, from 2001 to 2019 and during this COVID situation. Oh yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I was reading some of the statistics that the students had on their posts. And it was, um, what was one of them? Uh, 500, 600 rapes in nine months or something. In the US, it's 75,000 in nine months. It's 100,000 a year. And uh, like, there's a combination of being underreported elsewhere, right? Women don't report, but it's underreported in the US also. It's just I'm that you do need to know that the US, even though we have money, there is a lot of violence in our country. Um, and, the tr and it's also reported. So that's the other thing. It's just very hard to know because this, mistreatment of women is so silenced, right? It's silenced by men, it's silenced by the women themselves. So it's really hard to get the statistics. But anyway, that's good, Mahira. Um, Pooja, are you there? Yeah, there you are. Yes, Professor, hello everyone. So, when when we are talking about pornography, uh, I went to some uh, statistics and found that uh, one of the reasons why pornography is a ban in Nepal is it is a, it is ultimate uh, way of increasing rape in Nepal uh, or anywhere. But like if I'm talking about Nepal, it's it's a one of the way. So uh, I also believe that. Uh, pornography is a, a, a is an expect where uh, you know uh, where a rape is increasing because I I told in the last class that uh, the, those uh, among youths eighty percent minimum eighty percent of youths are watching these uh, pornography videos in in the sites and then uh, which is why it is still prohibited in Nepal and they don't, they, 
they don't you you know they are not allowed to even watch directly they have to own an, another app and then watch it like they can't even watch it directly so uh, i really i wanted to point out this on this uh, in in my part of discussion that's all professor thank you okay good um toma yes ma'am uh, i found uh, something about pornography in bangladesh uh, there are some attitudes and respecters um which in survey a survey was carried 2000 undergraduate student at jahangir nagar university dhaka bangladesh uh, who established an study uh, that found that uh, there are 72 percent of student consumed pornography at least once within their entire life and pornography half of them were occasional consumers and uh, it also published uh, approximately 67 percent encountered pornography during high school although females typically encounter pornography much later then logistic aggression analysis showed that the pornographic consumption was predicted by being male living in rural area and uh, being in a relationship engaging in online activities such as using facebook and watching movies then the another um, report in July 30, 2021, the Bangladesh Shangba Shangosta published a report on pornography, citing a study. Uh, the report revealed people of different ages download pornographic contents or Taka 3 crore from cyber caves in Dhaka every month. And it was more shocking to know from the report that 77% of porn viewers are children while teenage boys and girls as well as the students of schools and colleges are the biggest victims of porn addiction. Yeah, okay. So that's all. Okay, good. Did that surprise you, Toma? Yes, ma'am, surprised me a lot. Yeah, women have to, we women have to hang together here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Let's see, uh, Fatima, did you report last time? Hello, Professor. Um, I read an article based on uh, rip, uh, yes, rape and found that uh, it is a, a dismay new trend and um, in uh, Bangladesh society. Okay. A study, uh, statistic uh, showed that 2020 has already marked a uh, or uh, year for Bangladeshi women than past four years combined. According to Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh Human Rights Organization, uh, just uh, 963 of rape incident uh, where women are victim um, are reported between uh, 2016 and 2019. Both set of numbers surely under report rape. Uh, cases in Bangladesh, uh, so many women uh, remain fearful to report uh, in in this rape. That's just my... Okay, and then um, Rafa, did you have something? Is she there? Okay. Um, all right, so we'll do the next round of issues. Um, let me go, okay, she doesn't have anything, all right. Uh, let me go to the share screen and um, let's see, here's the FGM. Well, it's a PDF, here's the outline, I think. Yeah, okay, so, oh, I actually, I wanted to go to, um, uh, I wanted to go to a YouTube video. I've not done this before, but let me see if I can pull this off. Okay, here we go. It's, what is it, four minutes or something? I don't know. If I run a support service for women and girls who have been through female genital mutilation, FGM. When they come to the clinic, they are so frustrated, they are so upset that this has happened to them. 
in the sense that this was done by their family. There are four main types of female genital mutilation. The first part is when the clitoris, which is the top part of the private part, has been removed completely or half. When again, the clitoris has been removed and then the inner lips, which is also known as labia minora. Where the clitoris has been removed, the inner lips, and then they remove the big lips as well. And when they remove everything, the edges are stitched together, leaving a tiny opening for the passage of menstrual flow as well as urine. Type 4 is also known as unclassified, which include pricking the clitoris, sometimes introduction of corrosive material to the vulva area, or tattoo, cutting into the flesh or the rugae or the floor of the vagina. The immediate complications include hemorrhage, excessive bleeding. When you remove the clitoris, either with scissors or with razor blade, the child or the young woman will bleed. Women who've had female genital mutilation present with recurrent urinary tract infection, vaginal infection, and this can prevent women from getting pregnant because this will lead to infertility. Other complications include HIV because of using the same razor blade or the same equipment for girls pain during sexual intercourse, pain when having your period. If they have had type 3 female genital mutilation, we have to cut them open again because with a small, tiny opening, there's no way they can have normal penetration during sexual intercourse. A child can die from the short-term effect of female genital mutilation. A mother can die during childbirth. A baby can die because of asphyxiation. FGM can kill. We need to change attitude. We need to empower women and girls. We need to end FGM now. Okay. Very early in the morning. Whoops, sorry. Um, um, all right. Let's see, here we go. So that, that's a summary of the, pro, you know, the different types and how many women have had the operation. That's not how many get it every year. That's how many are living with it. Um, then the article is about whether we should judge this, right? Whether Westerners, um, should prioritize this, right? Well, you can't have sexual pleasure, that's terrible. Um, and then other Westerners or other people, and then you can, you know, I'd like your opinions on this. People say it's morally wrong to criticize the practices of another culture, unless you also criticize the comparable practice in your own culture or it's wrong to criticize unless you're, okay, so each of you came with something to present. Hopefully, if you didn't come with something to present, I'm just summarizing this and you can, when I call on you, you pick the thing you wanna to react to, right? Okay, you can't criticize someone else unless you have no evils in your own culture. Uh, it's comparable to dieting and body shaping because women mutilate their bodies for male uh, gratification. Um, it involves the loss of a capacity, but those women don't value that capacity for pleasure during sex. Uh, don't assume the Western culture is superior. Some women defend it, others criticize it. But many, there are lots of reasons for women to defend it, right? Um, they just can't, their, their daughters will not be able to be married. 
um, they can't speak out or they'll get into trouble, right? Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean they agree with it or enjoy it or believe in it. They just don't say anything. Um, okay, so in response, okay, women do criticize the obsession with physical beauty and the willingness to do harm to meet a social ideal. This is the answer to the objections. We can criticize other practices even when there are problems in our own culture. Uh, what's the difference between FGM and dieting? Okay, one of them is by choice. Um, the other one is by force. Um, a lot of the mothers don't want their daughters. Obviously, they don't want them to diet too much to get too thin. Uh, but the moms do want the FGM because it makes them marryable. FGM is not reversible and dieting is reversible. You can get a dangerously low weight, but you can regain the weight. FGM is dangerous and unsanitary. Uh, dieting is not unless it becomes anorexia. FGM has lifelong health problems. Dieting doesn't usually have it. And the notion of consent, right? Girls, um, it's ages. I mean, these are five-year-old girls, four-year-old girls. Oh my gosh. Uh, women are undereducated. They don't know enough not to consent. This is the same as child marriage and uh, how your husbands treat you. Um, the, the girls have no idea what it is that they, they've lost, right? The capacity for pleasure during sex. I mean, they don't even know what that's about. Um, it's linked to customs of male domination. It's just one more kind. Um, and so the ideal of female beauty is also connected to male domination, right? There's just a lot of things about women and their bodies that are patriarchal. Um, why does it occur so often in Africa? Well, because African women were farmers and so they couldn't be kept at home. So they were vulnerable to rape and uh, sexual abuse. And so this was a way to protect them. Um, in India, Another, another way was um, PERDA, they were just kept at home, so they didn't need the FGM. It's not in the religion, right? Religion is used to justify it, but it's not. Muhammad himself said it's not essential and it's not practiced in all, at all in many Islamic countries. It assumes women's sexuality is the problem. <laughs> is irrational and insatiable. If it's a cultural continuity, right? It's an initiation, right? It, you become part of the community, but this is not a good foundation for a community. It's not a healthy community. Uh, people who do the operation, it's women and they get respected for it. They get status, money, and they're given, you're the, they're like sacred, they're, at least in the past, right? They're like priestesses. And so they'll defend it. So women do this to women while they're being held down by women, right? It's women are uh, running the whole operation, but it's of course for the control, the purpose is for male control. Um, there's lots of other ways women are oppressed. So uh, you don't have to obsess about this one. Education would be important. Um, women who have, um, uh, yeah, comparing it to nuns. So nuns also never have sex, but again, nuns choose it, right? They don't get it forced on them. Nuns choose celibacy. It's not unhealthy. They don't end up with all sorts of health problems. They are traumatized. It's not painful. Um, how do women, yeah, mothers can't make informed choices or um, some mothers of course don't want it to happen but there's nothing they can do. 
Um, so yeah, from the point of view of a mother, as a mother, how would you feel, you know, to have to have your daughter go through that really painful uh, operation? So why don't we, I'll just start you out. So we have one hour and we have two rounds, right? We have this one, and then we have the other one about women's bodily mutilation in general. So we have about 15 students. That would mean you each get between two and three minutes. So try to sort of pace yourself because I don't like interrupting you. So that's, that's the time frame. Okay, Roshani, what do you think? What did you think when you read about female genital mutilation? Um, Professor, it was like, I didn't know this before. I didn't know. Like, you didn't know about yeah, it? I didn't know this, honestly. And I was okay. like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> Maybe I was not much conscious or what, but I didn't know the, um, you know, the FGM thing earlier. But when I knew it after the video and all the reading, I was like, oh my God, this can be happen. And these things, uh, you know, these things can go. And um, I, how do I react to this? Is like, it's very strange for me. It's um, I don't know why people do it. I either for good pro if they are using it for a good purpose and for them, maybe they know the pain and they know the benefits of it. But as long as I suggest, um, it's not uh, maybe appropriate. Uh, like if they are, as you said, like it is, it it is done for the children who are like below, right, without the consent. So this is totally unfair totally not um, justified i guess i i would say because uh, uh, if they are doing it willingly on the basis of their uh, safetyness and all then maybe they are right on their way or on their perspective but are uh, doing uh, like doing something forcefully and um, without their consent is not um, morally ethically right so we should uh, always consider the uh, moral and ethics of someone, someone's life. And other than that, um, there are options. Why do they do this? I don't dislike it. Yeah, Professor, that's it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the reason was, you know, to make sure women are faithful and to, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there is this pattern, right? It's a pattern of male domination. It's a pattern of blaming women because women are oversexed and women can't control themselves and women have to dress moderately, right? Because it's all their fault. So there's all this problem. Uh, if you don't dress right or you don't wear the headscarf or whatever, then you're sort of in trouble. So. Professor, like instead of uh, one more thing, like instead of like women has to do a lot of things, like a lot of contribution in many ways, right? So, uh, like even for this as well, it's only women that who has to be uh, conscious about all this. Like, why don't we educate men, or why don't we teach something so that uh, you know all these problems won't be arise or something like that? When we talk about these issues, when we talk about any crimes and all. The only thing comes in, my, in mind of, of everyone and only thing, only solution that gets is like, women should do this, women should do that, women should not go out or women should stay, women should do that. That's just nonsense. Like why only women? If men were educated as same from their young age or from early age, and if they were aware like that, then there should be some balance or there should be some reduction, right? In some extent. Yeah. This is it, professor. Sorry. It's, yeah, that's why I teach it like for education, it's better not to just teach one issue at a time, but to see the patterns, right? It's, and that to me would be how to educate men is to combine all this stuff and show them there's a pattern there, right? Um, but anyway, life goes on. Uh, Marzia, what about you? Good old Afghanistan. Uh, professor, uh, for me, it was not shocked because I have heard about it and watched some documentary. But about Afghanistan, it is not sustained that it uh, it practiced in Afghanistan. And I think it is not practiced in Afghanistan. Oh, really? Not at all? No, no. That's no. Uh, 
but I have watched a documentary from a girl in Africa that uh, her parents and all people did it, but she, when she got married and after her marriage, she uh, understood the side effects of it and she wanted to start a campaign against it and her husband supported her and then she came back to her family and uh, talked to her parents, especially her father, because uh, it was the fathers who ordered everything. Then her her father accepted that he will not uh, practice it in her family. And then after that, he talked to a very high position religious man in the country. And then uh, after when he uh, agreed that he will announce that it is not uh, like uh, necessary according to religion. So after that, like uh, the president of the country also announced, I think this is the documentary that, which is available on YouTube. Uh, and uh, uh, like this is this was a very uh, high achievement for that girl because she all she already uh, experienced it. Uh, and I think I think it's really a, a very bad kind of abuse. Uh, but it's like uh, because it's not for once it's a long a long life um, a lot of a lifelong uh, pain and also it, it it it's it's really disgusting yeah um i think maybe one reason it doesn't happen in afghanistan is they they women are secluded right they're kept at home and so in situations where women are not allowed to go outside or not very much, then that would be, it, it wouldn't be so much. So it's mostly in Africa when women had to go out and work on the farms. So, um, all right, Fayaza, what about you? Did you do some research or make a comment? I have many things to share, but I will like sort up everything. Like, uh, I was one um, part of the FGM research. Like, I, we have something. So I did the research uh, with uh, one of doctor. So during that, um, I I I knew about that. That is our culture. Okay, so Muslim people we have the that whole uh, name Katna. So like I was thinking, yeah, that is culture. It's not that much because uh, when we born and within 14 days we have to do this uh, but male male also have like this they also want to do uh, like this katna part but they uh, male can do when they like uh, two years or when they born like before the 40 years 40 days or something they can do but women, they need to uh, do this uh, within 14 days. So we used to like, uh, we just talk with the people who are doing this. Okay, so 90%, 90 percentage of Muslim women, uh, like they, they used to do the FGMs, like the Katna. So we talk uh, talk with them, the people who are doing, it's a cultural perspective. So we ask, ask to them uh, they are not medic medical like uh, field uh, background or something so we ask like they said my mother was uh, uh, like doing this person and now I am and my daughter will do this is like our family like family doctors like it's become a, like a generation what country and, what country are you in Sri Lanka ma'am okay go ahead and uh, and other thing is like uh, so I asked from uh, them so they say like uh, in uh, that is controlling females feeling so if we cut that part because the, the small piece right so if we cut that part it is controlling females feeling so they are not going to like sleep over with the men and they was like uh, they openly telling that so I was asked, uh, so my doctor and me, I was asking like they are babies right so if you are cut if the bleeding is uh, happen what will you do so we have something like the medicine and we can apply that it's it's kind of traditional medicine like the thermotic powder and, and all like that type of so we got that response from them so 
we talk with uh, the new generation of people. So they say, uh, I am not going to do to my daughter. I am not going to do, do this. Because it was like bleeding and it will be painful for my daughter. So uh, they are not going to accept this. They are not going to follow the FGM process. Uh, whatever it's cultural way or something. So we asked from the midwife. Midwife, no, right? The, uh, so she said like uh, most of the Muslim women are coming to the delivery time. They are giving a back very quickly. Because they have cut that part, it is easy to deliver. Uh, but Sinhalese or Tamil people, they didn't do this. So that time they are like taking too much time to the delivery. So uh, we got this response from <laughs> during this research. Just I summarize, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, very. That's interesting. At two weeks, they get cut when they're two weeks old. Wow. I never heard of that. So that's interesting. Um, Toma. Ma'am, uh, exactly. I know, I even know very much about uh, that before. Um, I just get it um, when I uh, read about your, the articles where you sent. Uh, so I research on it and I found something and I also watched some videos in YouTube. Um, and it was really shocking for me um, that uh, which has happened in our society or in our country um, and all over the world. Uh, so I think uh, for me, it is not okay uh, for doing this kind of stops because it is not um, good health benefits. It has only just harmful for health. And um, also, uh, for me, uh, I think the FGM has no health benefits and it harms girls and uh, women nearby ways in involves removing or engaging um, healthy and normal female genetical tissues, uh, which is really abnormal for uh, females uh, to do this kind of things. And also it interferes with the natural functions of girls or um, and women bodies, which is really annoying for me. <laughs> yeah, so you can soon be stopped. Yeah, so this is going back to the United Nations. You remember that capabilities model that I had that paper that we have these natural capabilities and anything that deliberately cripples somebody in their capabilities. And so that yes. to me, that could be a universal uh morality you know it, it's not just westerners being uh criticizing non-westerners but um does that make sense to you toma yes ma'am okay um mahira oh ma'am uh, when i first read about that uh, i felt uh, terrified and shocked because it's not a thing here in Bangladesh. I don't know about the rural areas, but uh, in my area, it's not a thing. Um, so if anybody asks me to do that, I think I will probably run away. <laughs> I will not do that. But when I researched about it, there is no data uh, about FGM in Bangladesh, but I found some data uh, about Middle East countries like Egypt. I have some data about that countries. Can I say that or data or? What did you about about FGM in Middle East countries because there is no evidence of FGM in Bangladesh. Okay. Did you find out how much FGM there is in Bangladesh? No, ma'am. When I searched about FGM in Bangladesh, uh, they said that, that there is no report or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. There's no, that's what I thought. So, okay. Um, Habiba. Yes, Professor. Professor, can you hear me? Yep. Professor, I need to think a little bit about it. Hello, Professor. Hi. Professor, I need to think a little bit about it. What? 
I mean, I have to think a little bit about it. Oh, okay. So, Amina. Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is completely new for me and shocked about uh, women, like about, uh, about them. So, and also it's a kind of uh, terrible for health. So I, I didn't heard about this before in my society or in my country. So ma'am, it's completely uh, like uh, harmful and terrible. Uh, I think that, that's all. That's all, okay. Um, Kasturi? Uh, professor, so uh, I got to know about FGM when I was in Access Academy, <laughs> actually. Oh, so okay. uh, uh, we were uh, given a we were given an AC about it. So uh, I started uh, doing research about FGM afterwards. So uh, uh, it is not uh, a practice in Nepal, and uh, most of uh, the Nepalese people, they are not aware of what FGM means as well. Uh, after going through the outlines that you gave us, I uh, went through an article where it says that um, uh, a girl named uh, uh, Kiyoma, uh, when, she was, uh, when she just uh, began menstruating, her father decided uh, to mutilate her body. Uh, my, her mother, she uh, refused to do that, but then her father was like, uh, when I told you that I wanted to mutilate my daughter at the age of 10, you told me that you uh, need to wait for her to turn 16. And now she is already 16 and she has already started menstruating. I need to get her mutilated. And uh, since the father uh, was one of the chief person of the village that the girl uh, grew up in. Uh, he had to do that for his um, prestige as well. And uh, it is so heartbreaking to go through such articles. Uh, I mean, uh, it is actually a fact, a real story, but then it has been described in an article. So going through uh, the description of uh, description in the article about FGM, I got to know that uh, uh, many people in Nigeria and other African countries, they take FGM as a tradition. And uh, uh, so uh, the author of this article, he also mentions uh, examples of women being uh, women having their body mutilated uh, uh, by seeing uh, various uh, theatrical dramas and whenever he goes to uh, see his plays he gets to meet so many women who have got mutilated and uh, so one of the women that he made got mutilated when she was a child but then uh, she is not aware of which part of the body she had got mutilated and she says that uh, she had her sister uh, as well. Her sister also got mutilated during her childhood. But then when she gave birth to uh, two new babies after marriage, she decided uh, not to mutilate them, uh, which, is, uh, which is good, I think. Because like uh, once we go through certain things or certain incidents in life, I think that it's important that we learn something from that. I mean, we have to learn the consequence and effect of incidents that we go through. And as a conscious uh, living creature, we have to uh, we have to uh, have the thought that it's really important that we take initiative from within in order to bring a change in the society. So the sister I was talking about uh, in the example. Uh, is a change maker, I have to say, because like, uh, although uh, FGM is a tradition in Nigeria, she, she is the one who uh, told her that mm, <laughs> I don't want my daughter to get mutilated. Uh, she might one have not been... Sorry. <laughs> okay, Professor. She might have not been able to do that uh, as well, but then 
uh, her uh, husband was also educated and supported her. So I think that it's also important for men to be educated in order to uh, eradicate uh, bad uh, practices like FGM from our society. Yeah. Yep, education. And then also seeing it within this context of patriarchy, I think helps too. It's not isolated kind of treatment. Yeah, um, yes, Professor. Taslima? Yes, Professor. Um, yes, ma'am, it is very new for me as I even I didn't hear before about it, uh, but I did research uh, about my country, about Myanmar, but I didn't get any uh, specific information. Uh, but uh, after reading this article, I know it is uh, uh, very common in African country, which, is, uh, which has not had benefit for uh, girls and women and also uh, practicing uh, female uh, genital uh, mutilation uh, is a kind of violence for uh, their rights. And also it uh, in some cases, it has a long life um, health problem, uh, including um, uh, harmonious infections and overseas uh, at the time of uh, that operation. Yeah, that's all. Okay, does Lima good. Um, Rafa, sure. Rafa? Did you have anything additional to say, I guess? It is, uh, it is interesting to find out if the students knew about it or not. That's interesting to me. I honestly, I can't remember when I learned about it. So I can't remember if I knew in college or not, because once you find out, it's like you don't forget. Um, Dolana. Yes, Professor. First of all, it is completely new for me. I didn't uh, hear about it. And I have uh, uh, like, I don't know about it. And in my country, it was not practiced, like, and uh, when I searched, I did not get, uh, uh, like, any data. Okay, I, I wonder, you know, if Brock, it seems like Brock is, you know, pretty active in rural areas, and they would have had the data if it actually happened. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of countries where there just isn't any data. But, so but it, it was not practiced in our country. Well, like, yeah, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> I think. And and personally, I didn't like this. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, uh, Trin. And I, I hope it will it will be stopped. And I I like I hope so. Like. Yeah, I hope there's a generational change, right? The because it was so harmful for, like, there is no benefit. Yeah, there's no benefit. Um, Trin? Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor, can you hear me? Yep. I, uh, I really want to say about this issue. I am getting emotional right now. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to say thank, thankful to Professor that you bring a completely new brain knowledge to me. I haven't known it before, as I like other students. And I know about gender inequality or male domination or women's in human body issues, but I don't know about this. How come? And when once I can believe in my my eyes when I'm reading your your readings and just. What a breaking of FGM. What a breaking of shock for female genital mutilation. And I, I can, I can, I totally can't believe what is cultural ideas of femininity and modesty about this issue. This is a completely violation of the human rights of girls and women. I, I know in my country so far still have ideologies is that there is a need for women to ensure premarital virginity and marital fidelity. 
but I don't, don't think it's not that harsh like other societies where the, the this is going on. And I already asked the, the elderly in my community or anyone I can to ask about this issue. I like the question like, do you know about it before for the previous generation, but no professor. Luckily, okay. we, 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 we had an experience this issue. And I can see how an extreme form of discrimination against women. Okay. For good. this. And I just I did some research about my country, but um, it's just one of articles is show about the Asia, Asia Pacific region and among them having Vietnam still practice FGM, but no data is available for the specific locations. Yeah. Maybe okay. another communities. In Vietnam. So yeah. there are communities where it's practiced? Um, no, not no. professor. Yeah, okay, yeah. I would think yeah. not. I would yeah. think um, that they're not just because the cultural background. Again, the reason it's in Africa is women had to go outside and they had to be outside all day. So they were vulnerable. Yeah, that, yeah I feel um, so lucky that I, I am living where enough safe space <laughs> for for yeah. being who I am and yeah. live a better life, yeah, as a woman. At least, yeah, and I think one reason it's not so common in Nepal is it's not a Hindu thing. Um, but again, it's not required in Islam, so nobody should think it's an Islam thing, right? Um, there are women who are not Muslim who get it in Africa. It's an indigenous cultural thing, so... Um, and there's no way, it, there was no need to associate it with Islam. Muhammad said it was not necessary. So um, yeah. anyway, um, Kaula, Kaula, what is it in um, Yemen? Now, I would be really curious to know. Okay, I guess we, we don't uh, definitely want to find out what's going on in Yemen because um, it is a Muslim country. Women are, the gap between women is huge. Um, and Rafa and Kaula are from there, but maybe they're having trouble, you know, maybe uh, they're- Professor, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so Rafa, she has uh, commented on the chat box regarding FGM in Yemen. Uh, could you please go through the oh, chat box? Okay. Well, it's very informative and really sad to go through what she has written. Let's see. Is she the one that wrote the long one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, actually, I didn't see this. Circumcision is still present in practice in our country and under cover of the religious concept, despite the existence of groups of educated people but they still believe either for religious or other reasons that female circumcision is a duty. While some believe it calms the woman's lust and restrains her desire. Although um, it has not been proven that that happens. A woman without circumcision can make uh, her out of control and that all humans know is the tyranny of lust in the male and thus he commits many crimes such as rape, harassment and others. Um, okay, so a woman who hasn't been circum circumcised will trigger lust in men. And that's bad because, you know, men are, that would be the beast. They would act really bad. So women have to get circumcised so that men don't rape them. <laughs> Yeah, really, uh, uh, it's pretty crazy, you guys, to blame women for that. But anyway, good, thanks, Rafa. Um, uh, I don't know if Kaula is there, but anyway, Bristi, do you have any other comments? Do you have anything to add? Did you find any other information? Yeah, Professor, so uh, it was, uh, I mean, I was not aware about this topic before, and it's uh, uh, new for me. And I was feeling so scary while reading this. 
so as bangladesh has uh, doesn't have any statistics uh, on this topic but i find that uh, all over the world at least uh, 200 million girls and women alive today have undergone fgm in 30 countries and every year about 3 million girls and women are at a risk of fgm to harmful health consequences also i came to know that in 31 countries in africa and in oops Bisti, we lost you. Yeah, Professor Chami. Are you there? Yes. Did you have something else to say? You were in the middle of a sentence. Oh, no. You're done. Okay. So it was okay. how many million a year was your statistics? How many new... How many women every year get mutilated? Every year, 3 million girls. And 3 million a year, and there's 200 yeah. million uh, alive who have had it. Okay, good. Yeah. That's great um, to know. <laughs> it's not great. It's just great to know. Yeah. No, okay. Great. Pooja. Yes, Professor. So, uh, FGM, I... I I didn't, you know, I haven't studied about it. I mean, I didn't know much, but when I was going through uh, some biological process and also uh, the cultural effects at the same time, psychological effects through it, uh, it had a great, a prev I mean, like it had a great percentage of showing the prevalence rate. Right? And then I was like, yeah, as I mentioned also in the chat box about, you know, uh, the uh, the cultural practice, uh, not in our, in our country especially, I, I haven't been through that, but like about the African countries and Middle East uh, where they have to you know, culturally practice this system and almost 3 million of women annually are uh, going through this procedure. So just, uh, not uh, much discussing about it. I, I want to just put it up here about the psychological and physical yeah. effects uh, on their health uh, when they go through these uh, procedures. That's all, Professor. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, all right, thanks. Um, Nizali, do you have something in addition? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I uh, just heard about this FGM before, but not this much with details. So I'm, I, I have the problem that I'm wondering, is this kind of things happen? Even in today, we are in 2021. So why such kind of things, we can't avoid them from our societies. And um, we can we know that female genital mutilation is a very, uh, very hard form of uh, violence against women and girls. As I know, uh, when I go through the outline uh, ma'am posted, I, I feel that I should search how this thing happened in Sri Lanka. As I know, there is this practice uh, here in Sri Lanka among uh, very uh, some groups of uh, people, especially uh, as far as I said, in, with, among the Muslim people. But there is no information or data uh, found, or, and there is no law about this um, about this thing. And so I did not know that there is an issue of uh, this. As far as I said, ninety percent of uh, women's in their community. So I was shocked about hearing that. So yeah, yeah, it is interesting. Again, it's really nice to go to AUW because. The, the, the students come from such different countries and then you can find out, you know, how the cultures are different, but hopefully as women, you can bind together and not tear each other apart because of other cultural differences. That's, uh, that's the way oppression works. Um, yeah, the most most shocked thing is that I'm also from Sri Lanka, but I didn't heard that issue is that much uh, right. happened. Yeah, it's ignorance. 
I wonder how many countries actually have laws, because if you actually have a law, then you expose the fact that it's actually happening, <laughs> you know, as long as you keep it silent. Um, yeah, silence is a, is a really big factor in oppression. Uh, Fatima, what have you got? Yes, Professor. Actually, uh, this is the uh, first time I researched. Uh, uh, in the research, I found that estimate there of uh, the prevalence of uh, abdomen uh, variant shows have constantly found uh, the practice uh, to be undergo uh, by the majority of women uh, in the Horn of Africa. Yeah, okay. Um, that's it, ma'am. Okay. Um, Janifa, you said um, it's new for you, um, but you're worried if it's happening in your country. Um, again, what country? I, I'm sorry, I just keep forgetting what country each of you are from. Um, and then, do you have anything else to say, Janifa? Or can you unmute yourself? And then Sauda, and then we, we do need to move on. So Sauda, did you have anything to say? Uh, yes, miss. Uh, this topic is really new for me. Uh, I didn't even hear this topic um, before. Okay, so, so that's important. Not only did you not know, but also women do it to other women, right? And so it's it's all women yeah. doing it to each other. I did other. a little bit research of this topic. Eighty uh, percent of case occurring, uh, this case occurring in Africa. The impact of COVID nineteen has made some of the statistics on actually even worse. Uh, Mostly, Switzerland is committed to defending uh, fundamental human rights, uh, like preventing and com combating sexual and gender basis violence as well as its uh, foreign policy. Okay, so let me. Okay. Um, well, do you have anything else? Because we're getting behind now. So um, let's see. Oh my goodness. I gotta I gotta get out of this. Um, now I gotta try to get back to where I was. Um, okay, so here's the other one. This is an outline from a book. So I have eight pages and that's why I have to whip, kind of whip through this. And then if you don't get a chance to talk um, next time, you can. But this is a whole book about how women mutilate their bodies or get, or get mutilated just because they're women, because men, somehow men take pleasure in that or they feel it's necessary, whatever. So the Suti in India, again, this, I don't think this happens anymore. I don't, you know, we're not stereotyping. We're not, it's not a cultural superiority thing. It's just a showing the history behind how pervasive this is. Uh, the word, for example, femicide or gynocide, killing of women because they're women. We don't even have a word for it, right? But it happens like it's all over the place, but you don't even have a word. So then you don't notice it. You can't recognize it. It's just all isolated little events. But if you have one word, all of a sudden, wow, like everything fits together. So it was legally banned a long time ago, but this is the problem where there's poverty when a, when a woman becomes a widow, she doesn't have any money and she can't work. So instead of that, she jumps on the funeral uh, when the, among Hindus, when the body is burned, which is the way they ritualize death, 
then the woman is expected to jump onto the fire and burn herself to death. Um, in rural India, uh, this is, and this is in general how women die, right? The femicide or gynocide. Um, so a lot more females die before age four. And there's understandable reasons for it because of poverty, but still, <laughs> um, it's female mortality is higher. Women commit suicide. Have you ever heard of dowry? I don't know if you if dowry deaths occur in your countries. Um, oftentimes they're called kitchen fires. <laughs> oh, gee, the, she was cooking and a fire started in the kitchen. Uh, it's actually a people want another dowry. They want their son to marry somebody else because this one didn't have a big enough dowry or because they've spent the money or sometime. Um, there's maternal mortality because they get married too early, they get pregnant too early. Um, but then they get, okay, religion is used. So the husband's death is caused because the wife sinned in a previous reincarnation. Uh, therefore, she's despised, right? Um, older men marry child brides. They could turn to prostitutions. They could be drugged. Um, so what happens to widows, right? What happens when you have a child bride? Your husband is going to die. How are you going to provide for yourself? Well, besides jumping on the fire, right? Prostitution, uh, sometimes even the woman's son will drug her and throw her into the fire if she resists. And the other thing about this book that you would find outrageous if you ever wanna find the book online or something, is that she talks about how Western, white, privileged, educated men write books about these things and they say all this outrageous stuff like how do you know <laughs> you know it says in the webster definition it's the act of a hindu woman willingly cre cremating herself uh, as an indication of her devotion to how do they know <laughs> how do they know she's willing you know she's forced um, and then Joseph Campbell, um, after there was a description of a woman who it was indicated that she died from suffocation, right? She didn't voluntarily jump on the fire. Um, he writes, in spite of these signs of suffering and even panic, we would certainly not think of the mental state and experience after any model of our own more or less imaginable reactions to such a fate, for these sacrifices were not properly individuals at all. These, they were particularly beings distinguished from a class or group by virtue of any sense of realization of their personal destiny or responsibility. So he's saying these women just play roles. They don't have any sense of themselves. And so we can't project onto them that they might have wanted to live because of course they didn't. They just, of course, wanted to jump onto the fire or die. <laughs> yeah, really, tell me, Mr. Campbell, what else do you know about these women's minds? I mean, think of how outrageous that is. Um, she pleaded to be spared, right? Here's another case. But, he, but okay, this is what happens. If her son would lose caste and he'd be humiliated unless his mother jumped on the fire and killed herself. So when she didn't, the son bound her and threw her onto the fire. Um, and then again, these scholars, these white male Western privileged sitting in your office all day kind of guys, write as if they agree to it. How do they know? Uh, it expanded over time from the highest class to the next highest. Um, uh, it include women during a war when people are afraid of being overpowered and their women dishonored, right? So if, uh, if they're afraid somebody's invading 
the country and they're going to invade the village or whatever, you just throw all the women onto the flame rather than have them get raped. Um, and this is a misinterpretation of the Hindu scripture, and it's a misinterpretation of the law of karma. karma. Uh, this assumption that women are just performing roles, they have no personal identity. Um, uh, let's see, she's the female, she is the female who really is something in as much as she truly and properly a player of the female part. She's good and true in the ethical sense, um, but she doesn't have any separate identity like we in the West do, right? It's the Western superiority complex. Um, yeah, and this other scholar says, well, this gives us insight into the Orientals archaic, like backward soul, this appalling, uh, phenomenon of how how degenerate and how primitive these cultures are. So you fluctuate between the culture that sort of idealizes the woman who has another uh, identity to the to the white male scholar who demonizes. Oh my God, they're so primitive. You know, <laughs> there's no common humanity. That's the only thing they deny that we have any common humanity. Oh, God. Okay. Child brides. All right. So we've, we've talked about that a lot. Um, girls. Okay. And then there's blaming the victim. Um, okay. So yeah, young Hindu women don't have sufficient regard for their honor to resist getting seduced. So um, they can't be left alone all the sexual responsibilities placed on the woman. Um, and then these research, right? And the Ah, Roshani. Okay. Um, that was a mistake, Professor. What? It was a mistake, Professor. Oh, okay. So the mothers-in-law blame their daughters-in-law for the son's death. Right? So, okay. Uh, men condition women to blame each other. Um, okay, then there's this other just rewriting of it. They keep projecting onto other people. Um, okay, so the scholars identify with the oppressor. Women choose to, pour, to do this. The feminist researchers, right? Um, let's see. She, okay, so there's a researcher of a feminist who exposes the patriarchy. Um, they're accused, okay. So then uh, men in the developing countries will accuse these feminist scholars of being imperialists, nationalists, having a superior, you know, telling us you're better than us, you're racist, you're capitalist, right? Just for criticizing the practice of widow burning or FGM, right? Um, okay. Uh, the pattern of a, a sado ritual syndrome, um, sadistic, oh yeah. The religious obsession with purity, right? Whenever people get obsessed with purity, um, uh, women get blamed and women get um, erased. And I think, what is it? During menstruation, you're considered impure um, and women, Religious get religions get associated with purity, and somehow women are not pure, so they're not as holy, or they tend to be more degenerate for that reason. Um, okay, women are used as scapegoats. Um, okay, Chinese foot binding. Here's another one. Oh my gosh. 
the torture and mutilation. Do you know about Chinese foot binding? I don't know if you knew about it. Anyway, it's done by older women. So women learn to hate and distrust women. They, so they depend emotionally on the men. Um, they're not supposed to know that the men are behind it all, right? They think that it's literally this woman who really wants to harm them and hurt them of her own free will. It has nothing to do with men. Um, men are not responsible. Um, but it's the same issue. They're afraid the girls will not get married unless they do it. Men get sadist uh, sadistic. Okay, so women who have their feet bound are helpless, right? And so that's a turn on for a man, right? She can't do anything for herself. She can't run away. Um, and they might, you know, they might feel sorry for her or they might get this pleasure out of her, but it's not healthy, right? The whole thing is really sick. Um, and a lot of men don't even know that it was patriarchy that was the cause behind it. Um, yeah, in, in the US with um, prostitution, there's usually a male pimp who kind of, that maybe there's a teenage girl who's kind of running away from home. She's on the street. She doesn't have any, any resource. He acts like a father figure, like a daddy. And then he gets older prostitutes to um, be like the mother figure or to keep them in line, right? And so they have it like one big happy family. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it was considered beautiful to have... Uh. Professor, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so uh, I'm not really sure whether other uh, classmates here are aware of food binding in China or not, but then there's actually a novel on uh, novel related to this because uh, as a high school student, I, I studied it and it's really interesting to know um, about the culture of China in the past and it includes these food binding things and older people getting their older prostitutes as their uh, wives and uh, those wives taking care of their children and stuff. So, yeah. yeah, okay, good, Kasturi, that's great. Um, okay, there's a fixation on the details of it the legitimization, it's legitimized. Um, men enjoy squeezing the stumps, they call their, their big toes, the golden lotuses. Oh my God, they, uh, not all men do that, right? But it does happen. Um, okay, and these are just quotes from scholars. Then there's witch burning. So in the West, there was a huge, number of women killed because they were called witches. This happened in America, it happened in England, happened all over Northern Europe. Um, and I'll tell you, when I was in living in a small town in Arkansas, and I'm a single woman, and I live alone, and I'm independent, and I have, you know, I'm doing weird things, right? Teaching philosophy. But it would be single women who, um, rumor has it that they practice some kind of a witchcraft, which is simply herbal medicine. Like these women would be like the medicine women. They would have these skills that they get passed down and they would be killed and tortured as witches just because they were independent and they had these skills. And so there were times when I was living in rural Arkansas where it crossed my mind that, oh my God, you know, <laughs> if I were in Europe, you know, a couple hundred years ago, I could be considered a witch and get, you got hot lead poured down your throat. Like that was the punishment for witches. Um, you have to appease the wrath of God in order, you have to kill this witch because God is annoyed, right? You're going to suffer unless you do this to please God. Oh, God. Okay. Um, 
all right. There are women who are independent. And I started to realize that. I also, um, I mean, it was interesting because I did get accused, falsely accused of some stuff. Um, and it was surprising to me, you know, I mean, I didn't. And I said to my students, you know, somebody accused me of this. What do you guys think? Like, did I do something? And they said, no, Dr. Beck, you're just an independent woman. woman. And so some students are going to accuse you of that. And that's so amazing. Like in, in uh, 2018 or something that people would want to uh, demonize me, right? Just for who I am. And that was, it was disappointing too, because in liberal arts education, that obviously you should have been educated enough not to do that. But of course, we're almost out of time, but I'll start calling on a few of you. You don't have to make a lot of comments. Um, and then we'll start the next class. We don't want to have a lot of repeat comments, but it, it, it is interesting for you to know, to let the rest of us know, first of all, if you knew about any of this stuff. And second of all, if you found, we were going to, I put on the post that we could all find another kind of bodily mutilation that women do to please men. And so we can, we, we should go around the circle for that and see if, if there's a whole lot of it. I mean, there was another chapter in this book about gynecology, which is a healthcare specifically designed for women. And in the United States, it's still true that women either get underdiagnosed because they go to a doctor and, and say they're in pain and he writes it off, you know, that they're just pansies, or they get overdiagnosed. So your body is never good enough. So for example, when women go into menopause, they often get these uh, estrogen pills. And like, there was no need for that. And it did start having side effects. It was just, oh, you're not good enough, right? Or they get hysterectomies that they don't need. Um, or they get um, mastectomies that they don't need. It's just this constant, you're not good enough. Um, so I, I assume you already know about breast implants and liposuction. I actually have another, um, I have another outline where we can do that next time. But um, so Roshani, did you come with any example of women's bodily mutilation that in addition to all the stuff on the outline or did you have some reaction to the outline? I guess, I guess she's not there. What about you, Marzia? Yes, Professor. Did you have some reaction to the outline or some additional example? Uh, professor, about the outline and the passage that I have read, uh, I wanna say that I, the idea, that the most of ideas are respectful, respectful for me because it says that we should not like, uh, Mm, how to uh, uh, like uh, judge a, a religious belief. Uh, but I want to say that this is not something that uh, uh, this is beyond religious. So we must, uh, doesn't matter what religion, they should stand up and uh, together and fight against it. Okay. Um, did you think of any other kind of bodily mutilation? Have you, of women somewhere in the world? Uh, professor, I have watched a documentary from Africa that uh, women uh, like uh, iron uh, mothers, iron their daughters praise to flat it uh, in order to like um, control uh, men 
to not look at them and make them ugly. I have I have watched a documentary about that. Yeah, they get their breasts what flat. Make flat. It, I don't. Yeah, flatten it. Okay. All right. There were other things I remember. Women get their necks expanded, or they get their ears. Yeah. Yeah, the earrings that are just these huge earrings. <laughs> yes, yes, there is some places where they put some rings in their necks to make their neck longer. That's right. I saw that. Yeah, Professor, I also saw that like from their childhood when they grow up, the, the uh, amount of uh, like the number of rings also go high. So they even the uh, old women also. And it's. Yeah, okay, so we only have a couple minutes, but let's just, we can start next time with your reaction to the outline, the way the scholars, the way the Western scholars interpret all this stuff that's just outrageous. But the other thing is thinking of more examples. So, you know, there's Africa and the necks and the ears, but there's also in the US, there's liposuction and, um, breast implants and facelifts. And, uh, you know, I had students, I've had a number of students that their high school graduation present, $5,000 for breast implants. A lot of them, okay? And it's just, ah, I had a student who missed class, right? She missed class because she had some liposuction in her neck or something. I had a woman who cleaned my house and, and then she helped me because I had an artificial hip. So she was sort of helping me give a sponge bath or something, it was really funny. Um, but she told me she got this liposuction all around her stomach and it cost like $6,000. And here she is, her job is to clean houses. Like, and then every night, every night, she and her husband ate at this steakhouse. Like, <laughs> so she eats all this food that's really bad for you. And she gets fat and then she gets liposuction and then she goes back to work. And it's just, ah, <laughs> I think it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, Sauda, where am I living? Well, I mean, this is the US, right? So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's what planet am I living on, right, Sauda? Like, what sort of planet is this? Let's go to some planet that where women can actually be themselves. That would be a different kind of place. Um, all right, so you guys, I want you all to find some really crazy example and we can all have this combined discussion of how women are supposed to mutilate themselves, right? We got the skin whitening thing, but I'm sure I know each of you could probably come up with something in your country or something you read about. So, okay, we'll see you next time. And then after we finish bodily mutilation, we're gonna do, Af I think, Aphrodite next time. Um, is that right? Yes, the, yeah, okay. And actually, and I, okay, so we go to bodily mutilation, then we go to Aphrodite, who is, of course, the, the goddess of beauty. And then I have a paper by a student about Barbies, <laughs> Barbie dolls in the US. So, okay, we'll see you. And you can, yeah, you can think of some other. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, sure. You can also think of some toy or game or something in your country that's equivalent to Barbie dolls or Disney princesses or something. Okay, bye bye. Okay, Professor. Bye, Professor. Thank you. See you. Yeah. Bye bye.
yeah, that's that's what I keep saying. Not confirming. Kaula, are you there, guys? Oops, stop the recording. <laughs>